very good afternoon or evening to all of you. Uh, we are doing this uh, exercise in the evening, so uh, it is better to uh, say good evening although you may be attending this class at some other point of time. So, uh, today's agenda is to discuss about uh, one very important topic uh, which helps in understanding uh, various facets basic aspects of thermodynamics and that is properties of pure substances. So, uh, uh, what we will try to do is see if you look into the keywords. So, on one side you have a terminology called as property, on another side you have a terminology called as pure substances. So, we will discuss about what is a property, what is a pure substance and then we will connect these two together. So, when we discuss about properties we will uh, concentrate on some concept called as microscopic and macroscopic point of view. So, it is a way in which you can describe a system. So, in the previous lecture it has been discussed that what do you mean by a thermodynamic system and today we will discuss that how do you characterize a thermodynamic system. So, when we characterize a thermodynamic system one obvious way is to look into the microscopic constituents like atoms, molecules and try to analyze the system in terms of their either individual characteristics or statistically averaged behavior of many molecules or atoms. The later uh, uh, this statistically averaged behavior of many molecules this latter aspect is also covered under the purview of kinetic theory of substances or kinetic theory of gases if they are referring to gases. On the other hand by macroscopic point of view what we essentially mean is that uh, we are not considering individual entities as atoms molecules like that, but what we are considering is the fact that uh, there are a significant numbers of atoms or molecules and we are considering we are not considering their discreteness rather we are considering the medium as a continuous medium disregarding the discontinuities in the atomic level or the molecular level. So, that is also called as a continuum approach and the corresponding uh, point of view is called as macroscopic point of view. So, the thermodynamics that we are going to study in this particular course is essentially uh, studying the subject in macroscopic point of view or this is also known as classical thermodynamics. There are other facets of thermodynamics like statistical thermodynamics where one can give due consideration of microscopic point of view. However, it, it needs to be understood that not for all scenarios microscopic point of view will work, neither for all scenarios macroscopic point of view will work. Like let us say that you have a system where you have only few number of molecules, for example, a rarefied gas. So, if you have a rarefied gas, how rarefied the gas is? It is 
described by a non dimensional number called as Knudsen number. It is the mean ratio of the mean free path, mean free path. I hope all of you know what is mean free path that is the distance average distance traversed by a molecule before encountering a collision another collision. So, this is the mean free path and this is the characteristic length scale of the system. If there are only few number of molecules this mean free path is quite large because one molecule will traverse a large distance before encountering another one. So, then this Knudsen number is large and that will indicate that it is a rarefied system. So, there macroscopic point of view will not work. So, why macroscopic point of view will not work? Because in such a case you have to consider the discreteness of the molecular entities. So, you can no more consider uh, this as a continuous medium. So, this is an example like uh, uh, another example could be high speed gas flows which is as good as uh, rarefied gas flows in this particular perspective and uh, uh, many applications involving lasers or cryogenic applications uh, it is important that one looks for microscopic viewpoint. Not only that even in classical thermodynamics microscopic viewpoint is important. Why it is important? It is important because if you want to uh, assess or estimate certain properties which are not directly measurable like entropy for example. How do you estimate those properties? So, you have to take into account certain microscopic considerations to assess or to estimate properties which uh, cannot be directly measured. So, these are certain considerations based on which uh, I mean one has to decide whether you go for microscopic or macroscopic point of view. Let me give you one concrete example to distinguish the difference between microscopic and macroscopic point of view. Let us define the quantity or let us discuss about the quantity pressure. I am not going for a formal definition of pressure because all of you know what is pressure. So, when you say pressure the pressure is defined in the microscopic point of view in terms of the rate of change of linear momentum as a molecule say for example, a gas molecule encapsulated in a container interacts with the wall of the container. So, when the when the gas molecule interacts with the wall, so there is a change in molecular momentum and that collision history is used to calculate the pressure in terms of a microscopic point of view. On the other hand from a macroscopic point of view pressure is nothing but time average force on a given area and that force is something which is directly measurable by measuring devices. So, the same quantity just there are two different viewpoints of looking into it. So, when we understand macroscopic point of view, so uh, uh, then we come to the understanding of something which is called as properties. So, property is a macroscopic characteristic of a system. So, for example, we say pressure is a property, temperature is a property. We will learn properties one after another when we go through the basic laws of thermodynamics. So, uh, when we say properties, so by properties we essentially mean macroscopic characteristics of this of a system. So, when we say macroscopic characteristics of a system question is that uh, let us say there is a system 
how do you specify a system? So, to specify a system you define something which is called a state. State is condition of a system as designated by its thermodynamic properties. So, when we say condition of a system as designated by its thermodynamic properties, we essentially mean that a property will be defined or a property will be fixed up or rather a state will be fixed up by describing it in terms of certain properties. How many properties will be required to describe a thermodynamic state? We will discuss about that in uh, significant details, but right now when we say that we, we define something as state, we define a state by using thermodynamic properties. The next concept is something which is a thermodynamic process, because we understand properties of pure substances or we understand properties with an understanding that when there is a change in state that should be defined by something which is a thermodynamic process. Like through in high school physics you have learnt about certain processes like adiabatic process, isothermal process, these are certain processes which will lead to the change in some of the thermodynamic properties or maybe change in all the thermodynamic properties. Some properties may remain same, some properties may change. Now, the next concept is like we have discussed about properties, now we will discuss about pure substances. So, what is a pure substance? So, let us discuss about this. Pure substance is something which is chemically homogeneous. That means, if you take various samples from the substance, you will find the chemical composition same everywhere. So, that means that it is a pure substance. So, a pure substance is described by its chemical characteristics. On the other hand, there is a related terminology which is called as phase. Phase is not only chemically homogeneous, but also physically distinct. This means that a pure substance can exist in various phases. So, the question is that when we discuss about thermodynamics, see there are many substances which we discuss in thermodynamics, but let us as an example consider two common examples air and water. So, air and water are two very classical fluids which we commonly deal with in thermodynamics. So, question is, is water a pure substance? The answer is yes, because it has the same chemical composition that is and it is uh, defined by H2O and uh, that chemical composition does not change no matter in, in what physical state the water is. But the water 
can exist in different phases like it can be liquid water, it can be solid water, it can be water vapor. So, the understanding is that a pure substance can exist in different phases like water has its different phases. On the other hand, let us think about air. Is air a pure substance? Normally, if you think of uh, a gaseous air, a gaseous air is having a chemical composition which is uh, approximately homogeneous. However, if air is being condensed or liquefied, then a mixture of liquid and gaseous air will not be treated or should not be treated as a pure substance. The reason is that the liquid air has a certain chemical composition which is different from that of gaseous air and the reason again for this is that the different constituents of air have different condensation characteristics, condensation temperatures and so on. So, we cannot treat a mixture of liquid air and gaseous air as uh, a pure substance. Regarding phases like mixture of two gases sometimes can be treated as a single phase, mixture of two liquids can sometimes be treated as a single phase, it may not be treatable as a single phase. For example, if you mix uh, alcohol and water, the resultant mixture will have a distinct physical appearance. So, it will act like a distinct phase. However, if you try to mix oil and water, there will be two distinguishable liquid phases. So, the moral of the story is that depending on the physical distinction, sometimes depending on the microstructural characteristics and so on, the same apparent physical state or the same apparent physical characteristics might be attributed with distinct phases. Like for example, there are many examples in metallurgy where you have distinct types of solid phases which are defined as alpha phase, beta phase, gamma phase like that. Similarly, the liquid also can exist in different phases. So, a uh, phase is a very important terminology and the summary of this discussion is that a pure substance can exist in different phases. So, when we discuss about properties of pure substances, we will then try to understand that how many of these properties will be required to specify the state and that is something which is very important for that we will try to learn something called as thermodynamic equilibrium. A system is in thermodynamic equilibrium. it is in if and only if, so better, better say if it is in number 1 mechanical equilibrium thermal equilibrium. and number 3 phase and chemical equilibrium.
So, mechanical equilibrium means equilib equilibrium of forces. So, by equilibrium of forces what we mean is that all forces are balanced. So, if all forces are balanced within a system that means there cannot be any pressure difference between one point in the system and another point because a system under equilibrium will get deviated from equilibrium if you create a pressure differential. However, a system can remain in equilibrium with a pressure differential if the pressure differential is only due to hydrostatic effect that is due to fluid statics the difference in pressure because of the difference in height. So, a system in mechanical equilibrium must have same pressure throughout if hydrostatic effects are not considered if this is very important because normally when we say that a system is in mechanical equilibrium we normally say that it means that the pressure is same throughout the system. The general philosophy is it is not a question of whether pressure is same throughout the system or not. The philosophy is that all the forces are balanced then as a consequence of that pressure will remain same throughout the system if there are negligible hydrostatic pressure variations within the system. So, if that we neglect then mechanical equilibrium discusses about equilibration of pressure. Thermal equilibrium means equilibrium with respect to temperature because if there is a temperature difference across two different points in the system there will be a tendency of heat transfer. So, thermal equilibrium means the system has come to a state when there is no internal heat transfer that means that temperature remains the same uh, rather it, it can change but at a given instant it remains same throughout the system. So, it is called as a uniform temperature system that means uniform means there is no spatial gradient of temperature within the system. So, if there is a system everywhere within the system the temperature is same. The third point is very important phase and chemical equilibrium. So, phase and chemical equilibrium means see mechanical equilibrium is referring to a ten uh, the absence of a system undergoing acceleration where forces are balanced it, it, it will not go it will not undergo acceleration. Thermal equilibrium it is a consideration where the system has an equilibrium of temperature. So, there is no net tendency of heat transfer within the internally within the system there can still be a heat transfer between the system and the surrounding, but within the system there is no tendency of heat transfer between one point and another point. Similarly, phase and chemical equilibrium means that there is no change no further change of phase that is occurring that means that there is equilibrium with respect to any chemical change or phase change. So, that is phase and chemical equilibrium. So, how do you designate that like pressure is a property by which you designate mechanical equilibrium, temperature is a property by which you designate thermal equilibrium. Similarly, chemical potential is a property by which you designate chemical equilibrium. So, chemical potential we do not have a scope of defining and discussing chemical potential formally in this course, but I can tell you that physically what does it mean physically it means that it is the net driving force for a chemical change to take place. So, if you have several components let us say two components A and B or let us say one component one another component two 
and let us say that the phase number we are writing in the superscript. So, this one this denotes phase and this denotes component. So, the physical picture is something like this. Let us say that there is a system, this system has several phases, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3 in this way up to phase P, capital P and each phase has component, component 1, 2 up to C c number of components. So, when we say that, that there is chemical equilibrium that means chemical potential of component 1 in phase 1 is same as chemical potential of component 1 in phase 2 and this is same as chemical potential of component 1 in phase 3 and eventually chemical potential of component 1 in phase p. So, just like pressure same throughout mechanical equilibrium, temperature same throughout thermal equilibrium, chemical potential same at of a component, particular component same in all phases, this is chemical equilibrium. So, when all these conditions are satisfied, all of them have to be satisfied, no one will be violated, then that is called as, then the system is said to be thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, you have to understand that thermodynamic equilibrium is something which is like which is basically a hypothetical concept. It is a conceptual paradigm which in reality will not be existing so much when there is a change in state. Why? Because see equality in temperature, if you are transferring heat to a system, a system will take its own time to adjust in such a way that everywhere within the system the temperature comes to a new state and then we say that the system has come to thermal equilibrium. So, you require a time for the system to adjust to the change in state so that it comes to an equilibrium state. So, in reality if the processes are not very very slow you are not really allowing this time. So, when you have a system in equilibrium, a system in equilibrium when the process is very slow, the thermodynamic process is very slow, it is so slow that deviation from thermodynamic equilibrium is only infinitesimal. Let me give you an example. Let us say this is a piston cylinder, okay, let me draw it little bit on the other side because it may not be visible. So, let us say that you have a piston cylinder arrangement. A classical example, see in thermodynamics you will see there are many classical examples which come every now and then and a piston cylinder arrangement is one such case. So, in the piston cylinder arrangement, let us say in one case there is a load W and there is some gas which is there in the system. Now, suddenly this load is removed, if the load is suddenly removed let us say this is 1 kg, if this is suddenly removed then what will happen? Then this piston will go up because the pressure will fall, its volume will increase. This is very intuitive physics. Let us take another example, I draw in the other side of the board where you have a piston, same weight W, but divided into small slices. Say divided into n number of slices technically where n tends to infinity. So, practically a large number of slices. So, when you take these slices one after the other, this piston will slowly go up. 
you take away the first slice piston will go up a little bit you take away the second slice the piston will go up a little bit so in this way you will find that the same load being removed one gradually and another rapidly this is a this this also de this defines or this describes the thermodynamic process this also describes the thermodynamic process using the same external loading but this is a very slow process where the process is so slow that all the intermediate states are getting enough time to achieve thermodynamic equilibrium or almost thermodynamic equilibrium on the other hand this is something where the process is so fast that the system is not getting enough time to achieve thermodynamic equilibrium within itself so this is a scenario when the system is deviate it may be deviated from thermodynamic thermodynamic equilibrium but only slightly so for all practical purposes we can consider the process to be a collection of thermodynamic equilibrium states and this is called as a quasi equilibrium or a quasi static process or quasi static both are equivalent terminologies so you can describe a system in terms of its equilibrium properties very nicely during a process if the process is itself a quasi equilibrium or a quasi static process otherwise you may be able to describe the end properties but you may not be in a position to describe the change in state so how do you conceptually demonstrate it in a diagram let us say this is a pressure versus volume diagram so in this case you have the initial state you have the final state but you do not know the thermodynamic path by which it went so you may represent it by a dotted line on the other hand in the in this case you may have the thermodynamic path exactly known as a collection of equilibrium states so the next question comes that if there are equilibrium states how many properties do you require and this is the last question that we will address before ending up this module so let us see how many number of equations we have and how many number of unknowns we have so let us make a balance equations so first mechanical equilibrium means pressure in phase 1 is same as pressure in phase 2 is same as pressure in phase 3 is equal to same as pressure in phase number of capi capital p thermal equilibrium means temperature in phase 1 is equal to temperature in phase 2 is equal to temperature in phase 3 in this way temperature in phase p okay similarly you will find chemical equilibrium it means chemical potential of 1 in 1 is equal to chemical potential of 1 in 2 is equal to chemical potential of 1 in phase p similarly chemical potential of 2 in 1 is equal to chemical potential of 2 in phase 2 is equal to chemical potential of 2 in phase p and final equation is chemical equi e potential of chemical potential of c there are c components so chemical potential of c in phase 1 is equal to chemical potential of c in phase 2 in this way chemical potential of c in phase p so how many equations very quickly let us say so this is p minus 1 equations independent equations this is p minus 1 independent equations this is there are so this is p minus 1 this is p minus 1 in this way c number of 
p minus 1 equations. So, c into p minus 1. So, total is p minus 1 into c plus 1 plus 1. So, p minus 1 into c plus 2. Okay. How many unknowns are there? So, there are p unknowns for p pressure, there are p unknowns, this is capital P that is number of phases, there are capital P number of unknowns for temperature because there are p phases, each phase has an unknown temperature and each phase has c minus 1 number of compositions. Why not c? Because total fraction is 1. So, if you specify c minus 1 compositions, the remaining fraction will be 1 minus some of the other compositions. So, that is why if you have c components, basically you are talking about c minus 1 uh, compositions. So, for total phase p, it is p into c minus 1. So, we can say the total is p into c minus 1 plus 1 plus 1. So, c plus 1. So, unknown minus equation uh, minus number of equations, number of independent equations. So, let us see which one is more. So, unknown minus equation unknown is p c plus p and number of equations is minus p minus 1 into c plus 2. So, p c plus p minus p c minus 2 p plus c plus 2. So, p c gets cancelled. So, this is c plus 2 minus p. This is called as degree of freedom. So, if the number of equations were same as the number of unknowns, then you would have described the system without any freedom of specifying any property, because the equation themselves should be used to evaluate the property. But now, you have some more unknowns than the equation. So, some of the properties you can independently specify and that is called as degree of freedom f. So, what is f? This is the degree of freedom, this is the number of independent properties that you can use to specify a system. So, you can write this in another way that is f plus p is equal to c plus 2. This is known as Gibbs phase rule. So, this rule you can use provided there is something that you are considering. What are those some things? One important point is that it is a simple compressible substance. So, what is a simple compressible substance? So, simple compressible substance means see in a system in addition to pressure volume temperature changes you could have other effects like electrical effect, magnetic effect there could be other non so called non thermal effects like in addition to pressure volume and temperature change. So, that you, so if there is a system where the pressure volume and temperature changes, these are more important, much more important than the electrical, magnetic or other effects, then that is called as a simple compressible substance. So, here we have used pressure and temperature as two important parameters. We have not considered any electrical property or magnetic property. That means, other effects we are not implicitly considering and 
we are considering that the same components are existing that means we are not considering any chemical reaction. So, simple compressible substance and no chemical reaction. So, I will give you two examples before we conclude this lecture. So, one particular example of use of Gibbs phase rule. Let us say P equal to 1, C equal to 1. So, if you consider P equal to 1 and C equal to 1, that is one phase and one component, then F is equal to 2. That means, you require two independent properties to specify the state of the pure substance. So, what are these two properties? We will see in the next lecture. But important thing is these properties must be intensive properties. So, intensive property means a property that does not depend on the extent or total size of the system. So, that is called as intensive property like pressure, temperature, specific volume that is volume per unit mass these are called as intensive properties. So, the moral of the story that we learn from this example is I am repeating it again that the state of the property or the state of a simple compressible pure substance can be fixed up by two independent intensive thermodynamic properties. This is known as state postulate. So, I am repeating it again this is very important state postulate. The state of a simple compressible pure substance can be fixed up by two independent intensive thermodynamic properties and this is the proof of that. We will look into properties of water as an example in the next lecture to see that how we can apply this state postulate to actually define properties and understand various thermodynamic processes that we will take up in the next lecture. Thank you very much.